This is the Mental Health Administration. Um, and so it was HRSA, but Public Health Service too, because there were very, there weren't that many EEO offices in the Public Health Service generally. But the Public Health Service at that time included like the Indian Health Service, which was you know, mainly out in the West and so on. But you were at NCHS, right? I was at NCHS, which, which at that particular time was a part of HRSA and then became a part of CDC almost immediately. It was part of HRSA? I didn't yeah. know that. Well, HRSA was dissolved. So then, it's not the HRSA that we have now? No. Uh, huh. I guess I don't know enough of the bureaucracy from those days. Yeah. yeah so, so you were in NCHS, which is part of HRSA. Woolsey was director of NCHS, NCHS mm -hmm. but he arranged for you to be EEOO for HRSA. No, for NCHS. For NCHS. Okay. And there were several EEO offices who were created at that time for the public. Well, I guess it was a public health service. I just realized that. Because we were all together. Frank, Frank Miller, who was CDC, was also on the, on the team with me. I guess you're right. So I, never, I don't I'm, know why I didn't think I'm, that. I'm, I'm just thinking you're I'm right. trying to beat you. So <clears throat> right, you were, right. So, so were, we were all on the team together. In public health service. In the public health the service. O -O. That's right. We okay. were public health service officers. Uh, and then, um, um, for some reason, oh, I also was some kind of special assistant for um, upward mobility. Uh, I also became a special assistant in the secretary's office on upward mobility. Secretary of, of H H H H W. Oh wow! And then, uh, and then I was made a special assistant for whatever problems H E W had at the time. Was this Joseph Califano? Who was the secretary? Yeah, Crazy Joe. <laughs> So, the one assignment I got, I got several assignments, some of which, you know, you don't talk about, but, but one assignment that, that changed my mind about staying in the Commission Corps was I was assigned to uh, get communities to take control over old public health service hospitals that we were closing down. And my job was basically to sell to the black community that they could have their own hospital, basically. Which on the surface thought sounded like a good thing. Except um, after doing that for maybe a year, I realized these communities couldn't handle these old hospitals like that. These places were, you know, disrepair and um, complex to manage and so on, and while, you know, the government could manage them, some community in Galveston or Baltimore, where I was assigned, those communities couldn't really handle. And that they were so grateful, you know, and, you know, and they thought I was a hero to bring them this hospital. On the one hand, I knew it was really a disaster. How did you deal with it? Um, I decided I was going to leave the public health service. The Commission Corps. The Commission Corps. By this time now, I'm seven, six, seven years in. Yeah. So I didn't know you could leave it. They said that easy to leave? Well, <laughs> no, it's not that easy to leave. Um, again, Ted Woolsey, um, I wanted to resign, and he said, uh, well, why don't you uh, go to Georgetown, uh, get a master's degree so you can finish up. Um, and uh, let's see what happens in two years when you get ready to come back. <laughs> and so I went to Josh and I'm by statistics. And uh, by the time the two years was up at Georgetown, Ted Woolsey had retired. I'm not sure what happened. And um, the new director, uh, 
Should I say who the new director was? Sure, I mean, it's public. Okay, right? yeah, right. Ed Sontag. Oh, Ed Sontag, yeah, I know him. Yeah, he wanted to force me to come back to NCHS. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to come back to NCHS. I wanted to go to Atlanta. So we had a, what do you call it? Frank and open discussion. <laughs> And I resigned the commission court oh, at I that see. point, which he was apt, he was happy to accept my resignation. So, but by that time, I finished Georgetown, and um, and I was being recruited to UNC. So you know, um, Robert Huntley was chair of community medicine. That was the department of virus I was in. I at, at Georgetown, Georgetown. Mm -hmm. right, and uh, some of us, a couple, two of us, had done well in the community medicine course, and so he wanted to know if we were interested in starting the medical school on probation. We would have to be on probation for a year to see if we could do well in medical school, but we didn't have to take the MCAT. So I thought I never knew that that was even possible, but apparently you can do it on probation. <clears throat> it's the Georgetown Medical School? Yeah. But his wife was Joan Canoni. Uh, and he had mentioned me, I guess, I don't know. So, um, she was so wonderful, you know, she was just so warm. And then I said, well, North Carolina, I don't know. When did you meet her? I, mean, did you met her you I didn't meet her until I actually came here for the visit. How did you know she was so warm and everything? I mean, Over the phone. phone. Oh, so she called you? Uh, yeah, me. Is the was her husband actually from the office? I don't know which. When the first call. So she, she reached out to, to you. She, she reached heard out about to me. her from Robert. And yeah. You, you and she reached out to you. Yeah. And persuaded you to come to Chapel Hill. To at least look at Chapel Hill, <clears throat> because I was interested, in, you know, in that H stamp, like most people. In the Harvard. Harvard. Oh. Uh, so. I went to Boston and, you know, talked to a couple of people, came to UNC, uh, and like, in Boston it was like rain and cold and the people <laughs> were just cold, you know, and um, then I came to Chapel Hill and it was like 78 degrees, it was warm, sunshine, you know, and People Castle, smiling. yeah, right, <laughs> and Castle was fascinating, even though he smoked a pipe, which I thought was strange, but, you know, he was a fascinating guy, and he was talking about how, you know, um, we needed more quantitative people in epidemiology to work through some of the more complex variables and blah, 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 and to spend your interest in uh, issues of diversity and stuff like that, and that. Apparently, he was telling the same thing to Sherman James at the time and how important social uh, psychology well, was. But they were both important. That's true, but I, I just find it interesting that he basically told the two of us the same thing. And we ended up well, I, yeah. I mean, right. He's consistent. Specific to me, he was very well, consistent. Well, and he, yeah, tailor, right. you tailored your approach. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. So, uh, in spite of one small incident, I was, uh, I, I wanted to come to Chapel Hill. Yeah. And in the, uh, the small incident, um, I can try to edit it out if you don't want to take it. Okay, so, good. So, uh, so I'm there, I'm from, you know, I, I had my government stuff still, so I had my papers in a mail envelope, you know, the holy government envelopes. Like mail was handed back in those days, brown envelopes with holes in it. Oh, yeah, interoffice. Interoffice. These were your mail. papers for. And so, for my application and his, you know, CV and all that. To, the, to UNC. To UNC. Uh huh. <clears throat> and, and this professor came through and repeatedly told me to put the mail down. And, <laughs> and I was waiting for Castle. He thought I was the dumbest. Person I had ever met, he had to tell me three times to just leave the mail. So, uh, did you tell him that you were waiting to see John Cassidy? No, or? never did. And in fact, it was a long time before I would even talk to him because I was felt sort of, yeah. you know, whatever. He turned out to be not to be a bad guy, Certainly and he not. was right, <laughs> and he was uh, 
and he was a very important mentor to Sherman James. So clearly, um, it was just miscommunication. But I have to admit, that first year, I wouldn't even talk to him. You know, I remember being in that American College of Epidemiology Board of Directors meeting mm -hmm. in some hotel when you came in after the meeting had started. <laughs> You're right. You suitcase. Right. And uh, the, the, it was the president of the college said, you put it over there. You're right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, back in those days, you know. Um, that wasn't, that was not so far many days ago. That was what, in the 80s, I yeah, think, probably. Yeah, right. Oh, no, I was on the board. It would have been in the 90s. Yeah, that's right. It should have been 90. Two or ninety-three, I Something think. Like that. With that. Yeah. Well, actually, later than that, because I don't think I got on the board for a few years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so mid '90s, mm -hmm. something like that. Right. Uh, yeah. So it happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. it happens. it happens. I don't even think about it anymore. I mean, you know, it's what racism is a pervasive thing, and you know, many African Americans want to believe that we are not racist. You know, that it's only European Americans who are racist. All of us, you know, have these um, judgment based on how somebody look or how they're dressed or how they talk. Um, you know, it is the nature of the way in which we think, you know. If we didn't think like that, uh, you know, we would have died off a long time ago. Well, how else would one think? Exactly. I mean because although it's true with race, it's racism, but yeah. it's also done with class, with right. pronunciation, accents. Right. Oh, I, this person must be from there, right. and that whatever it is, or right. they didn't have right. this education, or things right. like that. So, right. Um, They're making uh, judgments, you know, um, from individual experience to the general. Um, why am I blanking on that? This is logic. But induction, anyway. Induction. Yeah. Uh, induction. It is the way humans, it's the way our brains work. So why people get so freaked out about it, I'm not sure. It is something all of us should be aware of so that we minimize the negative consequences of that way in which we think. But it is a part of the way we think. You know? Well, you know, when a doctor is, when, when you go to see a doctor and he's trying to evaluate your, your symptoms mm -hmm. and what it is, he thinks in terms of probability. Right, exactly. So what's this most likely to exactly. be? Exactly, exactly. So, right. Uh, Right, right, and we don't think it that, like for example, when that Ebola case happened in Houston, you know, people got upset with her because when he came into the clinic, she didn't think zebras. Most people don't think zebras when you go in; you think horses, you know. <laughs> right. So. right. Yeah. Though, of course, um, the other side of that, I mean, to, to be, uh, just so it doesn't sound as if I'm trying to whitewash everything. Yeah. Um, it's not a case that the majority of people with African American or lower education or whatever would be in a category that they're being placed in automatically. You know, like uh, the most classic one is crime. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I'm worried about crime, but that would imply that most of the people, I and mean, it's not like the, the, of the symptoms, if this is the symptom, the most likely diagnosis would be this and this. It's not necessarily the most likely diagnosis. Right, that's right. So, uh, right. Um, but uh, so it was a miscommunication. Yeah. <clears throat> but it didn't wasn't enough to turn you away from Chapel Hill. No, not at all. Not at all. Now, Although I kept, you know, uh, sometimes I would get a little paranoid because everybody was nice to me. I mean, everybody was nice to me. And I was, I mean, wait, what is this place? You know, in fact, when I finally finished Chapel Hill, I said, I have got to get out of this place. It is too nice. Everybody is nice. The weather is nice. It is ridiculous. You know, there's a world out there, you know. Did it ever occur to you that because the weather is nice, it maybe makes it easier for people to be nice? Maybe, that's true. <laughs> now, now, let's get the years down. So okay. which year was this that you had this interview with John Castle? And that would have been 1970. The end of 1973, I guess. The end of 73. Right. And then so you started here in fall of 73? or Fall of 74. Fall of 74. Yeah. Now, had you been in MCH before that? or MCH? No, I was never in MCH. My wife your was... Your wife in, was in MCH? Yeah. And when did she... She was recruited to also... At the same time as you? Right. So because once in? I came for the interview, she came with me. She met Arden Miller, and he just fell in love with her. So when did you get married? 69. Oh, I see. Okay. 
as soon as she finished Spellman. You know, at Morehouse, you had to grab marry a Spellman woman. That was required. It came with a degree. Okay. You know, and she was one of these extraordinary people, you know, smart, cute, very, you know, you know, attractive in a, in a style way. She was a musician, a harpist, you know, a composer. She just, you know, incredible writer. She was just one of these super people and Arden Miller just fell in love with her. So did she get it become a doctoral student? She came actually on faculty. She had an MSW from Howard. Ah. And she came on as um, faculty in the practice or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was in 74? That was in 74. So, but she was also working on her doctorate in the department at the same time. In MCH? In MCH. Oh, I see. Okay. So, in 74, you, you landed here mm -hmm. as a doctoral student mm -hmm. in epidemiology, mm -hmm. and you took Epi 160, presumably? Mm -hmm. 161. 161. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, right. We talked about this. Yeah. But you, that would have been John Castle giving the lectures in the auditorium, right? Uh, he gave a couple of lectures, but it was mainly um, it was mainly Amron. Because in in seventy two, fall seventy two, when my wife took Epi one sixty one, it was the lectures in the auditorium with John Castle, and then the lab and an additional lecture with Abdul Omran. Right. So right. was that was that the That's one in That's right. Seventy four. Right. 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 And uh, Abdul Omran was your advisor. Right. And my mentor, uh, and my uh, funder. <laughs> and your funder. And my funder. Did you have a CPC Yes, tradition? absolutely. Right. That, you know, he can't, the, who did, oh, that's right. I, they sent me to Armand and he put three pieces of paper in front of me and said, so I have three fellowships, which one do you want? You know, I said, well, which one pays the most money? He said, CPC. <laughs> so was it a Noise Foundation fellowship? Do you remember? Uh, no, I don't remember. Okay. Did it come with a 10 hour a week service requirement? It was a 10 hour a week service requirement because I, I became his uh, TA. At that time, uh, Barbara, no, what's her name? And, at Emory. Not Barbara Halka, but. Um, Carol Hogue? Carol Hogue. Carol Hogue had, had been his teaching assistant. Ah. So Carol Hogue interviewed me. Uh huh. And, <laughs> yeah, we. we, we uh, it had that very first Oh, really? Day. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. She asked me um, what made me think I was qualified for the position, and I suggested I was more qualified than she was when she got it. <laughs> I was being a smart ass. <laughs> that's very sad. I don't think she appreciated it. She, she did not appreciate that. It's probably not the answer she was expecting. No, no, no. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, when I walked into the room, I don't know why I just felt... Sometimes I have these days when I just want to mess with people. I don't know. And, and she just looked like somebody I could mess with, so I did it. So, whatever. But anyway, you were hired. Yes! <laughs> yeah, perhaps over her objection, I don't know. But, uh, she was moving on, I guess. Yeah, she was moving on. Um... You know, so so that was fall '74, right? And you started out as a, a teaching assistant, but in what? In, in epi, epi. Mm -hmm. but you were just taking the course. Yeah, but I, I had a master's in biostatistics, and I had uh, epi at Georgetown. Oh, so you did or you, for your master's, you'd already taken. I had already taken epi, you know. Okay. So MacMahon and Pew. In fact, that was a text. Uh -huh. on that. So I yeah, that one. right. Yeah, so I'd already taken the course. I was just taking it uh, because UNC wanted me to have on my record that I took the course at UNC. Right. But obviously, uh, you know, and I was in love with Epi at that time. I mean, I fell in love with Epi at Georgetown, so, you know, I knew Mac Man and Pew, you know. Um, so what was it like being a student? How, how were your student years? Um, I had a good time. You know, I, um, you know, I just, I mean, it was, the teaching was great. The, 
experiences that Amran gave me were great. Um, even, uh, and he didn't just teach me uh, epidemiology, but he taught me how to handle myself, you know. So I didn't get people like Carol Hope pissed off anymore. <laughs> off the bat. You know, so, um, yeah, it was great, I think. Uh, and then, um, early on in the next year, um, I became uh, head of the Black Stu what was then the Black Students Black Student Caucus. Black, Black Students Caucus. And, um, and we created a course called the Survival Course, Jim Morrell and I. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because black students who were coming to the school were not doing well in epidemiology or biostatistics. So our course uh, in the evenings at six were uh, to teach black students specifically how to survive biostat and epi. So for those years that we ran that course, I think it was three years, no African American students got less than a B in both of those courses. You know, and then, then other people heard about the course. So other students, primarily uh, ethnic students like Lumbee and other students started coming to the course, yeah. So were there a lot of black students then? No, not a lot. Um, as I remember, it, m my first year, um, my wife was not, because she was also at an office, you know, and discussions with Arden about stuff. I don't think people saw her as a student, even though she was a student. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so the one student I remember was uh, Janet Miles, or Mills, Janet Miles, I think was her name, uh, who was in Hawaii now. In, in Epi? This, she was no, in, she no. was in, it must have been health education. Were there other Epi students, African American Epi oh, students? Oh, no. Not that first year. Well, yeah, no, not that. Not that. It was just me. A year or two later, Jerome came. Yeah, who was later? Because I was here when he came. Right, and also Leo Hendricks. I think I was here when he came. Yeah, right. So when I came in 72, in fall of 72, mm -hmm. in the health ed department, mm -hmm. I think half of the class was African American that year. Right, there was, yeah. There was 20 students or something yeah, like that, and right. half were African American. And yeah. it was, I don't, it was the only semester, I mean, I don't know that it was that way before, I don't think so. I don't know, it was and not. It wasn't that way afterwards. No. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was because of Lou Nydorf being the head of admissions. I'm sure. Or something, but it yeah. was, uh, that's where I met Ethel Jean. Yeah. And, uh, Frankie because Morris. you had uh, you had also students in health administration that year, right? Green, Jean Brayboy and all them, yeah. And Curtis Jackson. And, and Curtis Jackson. Jackson. That's right. So also in health ed, I mean, so health ed and had them. Yeah. But not but biostat, not, FA, and not biostat, mm -hmm. and MCH. Uh, well, Cynthia. But she was. I think there was another student, but I who I did not know. Just one other. Yeah. Now. David Kleinbaum taught some kind of a summer course. Right. Was that before that or after that? Do you have any recollection? Well, I know David, I don't remember exactly. Dave, when I, my, when I came in 74, David wanted to write a book about Biostat. Mm -hmm. And he asked me if I was interested in working with him. And I said no. Because I felt that I was overextended. Mm -hmm. Big mistake. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, because David was a cool guy. David was a very cool guy. Yeah, right, right. I like that. His perks, books have you know. done very well. That's right, absolutely. That's right. And you could have done the short courses. That's right. <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, in the Epi faculty, anybody stand out in your mind? Any courses particularly that you took? Um... Who, who the, the, one, the one course that, you know, of course I love the, just the epi stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but the one course that, that stuck in my mind was Ralph Patrick's uh, at the Epidemiology of Program Acceptance. Um, and I didn't want to take the course, but Armand said, you got to, you know, take this course. So I took the course. And uh, uh, he was a, a anthropologist, mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and I remember sitting in the course thing, and then he was this cool white boy with white long hair, you know, and tall, thin, and you know, sort of laid back. And I was thinking, oh God, this is going to be a boring course. And then, you know, he starts talking, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, just let me out of here. And then after a while, I'm thinking, wait a minute, say that again. <laughs> you know, he starts talking about how people accepted the salt vaccine and the cultural and demographic issues around. How, and I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> so that was an interesting course. Uh, it made me rethink, you know, ideologic factors in epidemiology. Um, you talking about the Ponape Islands? Yes. That's right. You know, I talked about Margaret Mead's work, you know, and just fascinating. Um, and then uh, Ed Wagner's course, uh, I, at first, again, I started out thinking, this, I'm a biostatistician. I'm not interested in body parts. Why are you talking to me? You know what I mean? And then Which I was, course of this was his? This was something like the physiology or something like that. Okay, because there was a, a, a biomedical course that yeah. he taught for a right. few years. I That's think. it, right. He didn't teach it when I don't think he was oh, oh, yeah? Like oh, okay. I don't think so. Okay. Um, and so, uh, it, but it wasn't until we talked about the paper that I had to write for this course. And um, I started thinking about the um, circulatory system and how it controls blood pressure. And then I remembered the physics I took at Morehouse. And there was one part of the physics course that I really got interested in, it was cybernetics. You know, the way in which systems control themselves and how the body, uh, you know, how cybernetic systems could be applied to control the blood pressure. And he got me excited about, you know, that. Like he said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but it suddenly sounds interesting. <laughs> you know, um, but oh, I took um, I took um, Cook's course. Gary Cook. Gary Cook. Categorical, uh, categorical data, analysis. data analysis. And I went to the class, and there were like 50 students, and blah blah blah. And you know, so I went through studying, and blah blah blah. And it was work, you know. And then I go and take the uh, midterm, and there were four people in the room. All those other people were auditing. Because <laughs> the reputation of this course was not good in terms of being able to pass. Freaked me out. <laughs> yeah, so those are the kinds of experiences. Yeah, those are the kinds of experiences I had. You know, there was. Uh, it was cool. And the other, did you take the cardiovascular disease course? Of course, yeah. And that was being taught by Alta Roller? Yeah. At Perardo at the time? Or not yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. cancer epi? Uh, yeah, who taught Barbara cancer? Hawker, was she? Yeah, right. Yeah, and then her husband gave that lecture. Ooh, scary guy. Jerry anyway, Yeah. Scary gave lecture in cancer epidemiology? Yeah. He was, uh, he was, a, he was a interesting guy. He would get off on these tangents, and he caused a crisis for the black students at the school, you know. No. Yeah. I didn't know. Oh, he, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so, the student from um, some town near here, north of Durham, I can't remember her name, uh, black students. Uh, from Roxborough. Roxborough. She was from Roxborough. She, um, quiet. I was trying to remember her name. Uh, but anyway, Ethel something, I thought. But I don't know. Anyway. So he was giving this lecture, and he started rambling about black, the difference between black women and white women's vagina. And I'm thinking. And she's sitting there. Uh, and he didn't notice, apparently, or whatever. Um, and uh, when he sees her, uh, he gets, you know, he realizes that he said something inappropriate. 
So he um, uh, he he get, talks to her about uh, not mentioning this little incident that you know was just a misunderstanding. So was it a joke that he was making? I think it was some kind of joke or statement. Or I wasn't there on that one. Yeah. I don't know. But I know he'd come close to saying inappropriate stuff before, so you know I wasn't surprised. So, so, um, and she had no intentions of saying anything. But what happened was that when the discussion apparently between him and Castle, or Barbara and Castle, or somebody, Castle. Talk, wanted to talk to me about, you know, not allowing this to grow out of proportion. And I said, oh, I don't think it'll go out of proportion. Could you explain it again to me? Because nobody had told me shit. He was the first one to told me. When I found out, you know, we started raising protests, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, Bernie Greenberg, you know how Bernie was. Bernie was like this, you know, hand, that, mother hand that kept us in line, you know, and, you know, just wonderful person. Um, um, but he liked us to be nice to each other and, yeah, you right. know, and, and so on. And I was pissed. So um, I gave him a headache. I'm sure I gave him a headache. Um, but it finally got. Resolved that we got tired. I don't know which, you know. So, when I was a student in '72 in health ed, uh, the black students got unhappy with John Castle. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you heard about that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I wasn't as involved or connected in those days. Mm -hmm. But I think it it had something to do with the fact that he would often use African Americans in examples. I mean, blacks and whites. Yeah. Showing the health disparities. Right. And. I think he was doing it because he thought it was important. That That's right, he did. Absolutely, he did. But the African American students, or at least a number right. of them, said, you know, they're always putting us in a bad That's light. right, right, right. And that was a real kind of catch twenty two. It seemed. Right, exactly, exactly. Did you, do you? Could you give any more? I mean, you weren't there. So no, I think I that. think his. his uh, he talked to me about it when I interviewed. He talked about the fact. That you know, I had uh, my work had indicated a interest in this area about disparities and so on, um, and that you know he thought that this is the kind of work we really needed to do more work in and so on. That we needed to talk about it and bring it up and discuss it, um, you know. And I could see many black the two things that conservative black students tend to um, tend to be sensitive about. It is about uh, discussions about the disparities because they felt like they're being uh, put down. And then they, uh, many of them, want to be seen as intelligent. This is one of the things I, I, that I, Armand was, you know, fascinating. You know, because what he would say is, you, you don't have to look intelligent, you just have to be intelligent. <laughs> and that sometimes you let people think what they want to think to, when it's to your advantage. And lesson I never forgot after that because it came in handy at CDC. You know, what you want, uh, and I had thought about it fleetingly before, but not putting it into words at Georgetown. When I went to Georgetown, I think there were seven of us in the course. There were two blacks, three whites whose uncle or relatives were famous biostatisticians. Earl Bryant's son, um, several biostatisticians who, whose relatives were famous biostatisticians. And so they saw themselves as smart, you know, and we were not so smart. Jackie Kennedy and I were not so smart. And what I, that experience, uh, taught me was it's not where you start out it's where you end up because at the midterm they're ahead of us you know at the pre-final we were neck and neck but the final <laughs> that's what counts you know so um, you know it's 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 
Uh, it was an important lesson for me, not to feel like I've got to project that I'm smart. And in fact, let people think you're stupid. It's okay. You know. I've always relied on trying to look smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember, yeah. I remember one incident when I was at a, uh, it was before I enrolled in the school, I went to a summer course out at the uh, University of Indiana, the Kinsey Institute, a, course, a summer course in yeah, sex, 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 right, human yeah. sexuality. That's right. And we had uh, lectures in the morning. I think Paul Gephardt was giving a lecture or something. And then you know, people could ask questions and make statements and stuff. And so we had the session, and I, of course, stood up and said something and whatever. Afterwards, this woman comes to me and she said, how could you say that? Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know. I was just saying it. She said, but you looked so, so <laughs> sure. And then I realized that apparently I looked more authoritative than I felt. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But did John Castle say anything to you about the, the reaction, the response he was getting, complaints he was getting from students? No, he never mentioned it to me. Because um, I didn't really understand it fully, but I, I, I mean, I did. I mean, it, it, I, I think it was partly about the impression that was being given. It's kind of like de the deficit model. Yeah, you know, right, these right, people are right, less right. healthy and so on. Right. I, I don't. My impression is that he was sure, based on the South African experience, that this was an important thing to talk about, uh, and I don't think he would have. Um, it would have dissuaded him from talking about it. Mm -hmm. So, he never mentioned it to me. So and I would have come up, and I would have, I would have, I would have agreed with him. Mm -hmm. So, so 74 to 5, you were a student here, 75 to 6, and, and what then happened? And how did you pick your dissertation topic, and what was your dissertation topic? And oh, well, my original dissertation topic was the relationship between nutrition and infectious disease in Sahel, Africa. In where? Sahel. Sahel, Africa. Yeah, uh, the Sahel region, eastern Africa. Um, but nobody was interested in the topic. Um, and again, arm run. So, what do you want to do? Finish here or do this dissertation? <laughs> yeah, so I said, oh, well, that's clear now that you put it that way. You know what I mean? <clears throat> he had this way of not exactly telling you what to do, but asking you these, giving you these dichotomies that makes it real clear about what the real answer is. So, um, eventually, I knew that I wanted Amran as chair because at that point, you know, he had a lot of money, he had his own house back there, he was, you know, a strong chair. Um, and uh, uh, and I, had, I put seven people on my committee. Um, wow, that was reckless. <laughs> yeah, but it turned out to be a good idea. Uh -huh. Because uh, I had Richard Udry on my committee. Oh. And um, halfway through my uh, analysis, um, <clears throat> it was clear that he was not going to be supportive of me. So uh, I, would, I, was, I went to his office and uh, wondered if he was still interested in staying on my committee. <laughs> and that I would be fine if he decided not to stay. <laughs> So we got rid of the only negative person on my committee. Um, and it was uh, using, uh, I, what I did was create this data set of uh, infant mortality rates uh, and demographic variables for each county in the United States. Uh, you're trying to use small area data analysis and the first, one of the very first attempts in the county lab and later to try to analyze relationships and so on. So, what, so what you were looking at what variables? I was looking at um, regional, demographic, and whatever social variables that I could put into the model. So it's like an ecological analysis? Yes, exactly. That's what it was, an ecological analysis. And then there was an ecological, a mathematical issue that arose in the analysis there was something called the ecological fallacy. And what I, wanted, what I ended up also doing was testing 
the parameters when the ecological analysis gave a right answer and when it gave a wrong answer. Hmm. And, um, and so that was the methodological part of it. Wow. Yeah. So what years were those that you... That must have been, by that time, it was like 66 or 67. Six, I'm, seven, sorry, I'm 76 or 77. And, and so did you, but you didn't finish your dissertation, then, did you? Um, I don't know what I did, Vic. I woke up one Saturday morning. I had three or four chapters done. I woke up one Saturday morning and says, this, is too, this place is too much. This is too strange. I want to get back to Atlanta. Because so nice to you. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Uh, and I want to get out of here. So I just packed what, what my... What was that? That was... That was 77, I think it was. Spring? 77? Um, no, it must have been later. Fall? Yeah. Because I was here, in, I came in fall 77. Oh, okay. And I don't remember, I mean, I met you, but I don't remember whether I met you... But yeah, I did meet you, though. I don't know. Yeah, I would, yeah. I'd seen you. You would have been in the student room probably working. That's right, right so. exactly. But then you disappeared. Cause you That's exactly right. I just yeah. woke up one day and I couldn't find you anymore. So right. <laughs> I just went, I, I don't so know why I did that. So you went down to Atlanta? I just drove to Atlanta. Just, I mean, did you withdraw formally? Or I, no, I called Armand after a couple of weeks. I called and told him. He freaked out, too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So what did, what, when you got to Atlanta, what did you do? Um, I taught school for a little while. I worked like on the school? back of a truck. High school or something? Mm-hmm. Washington High School. Uh, worked on the back of a truck. Um, <laughs> anything I could find, basically. And then I applied for a job. Uh, for the state of Georgia, the State Health Planning and Development Commission, or something like that. Um, first time I ever applied for a job in my life, just out of the blue, applied for a job. And I went in there, they, um, um, the person in the personnel office called somebody and she said, wait here, um, uh, and then uh, 40 minutes later, he said, I think you have a job. Why don't you go out to this office to talk to Pat Leet, who was the director, and gave me a job for two years. A contract for two years. So that was it. There were still very few people with the training. Bionstad, Epi. But even without interviewing you? Uh, well, you know, she didn't. Uh, I, she didn't really offer me the job until I went out to the um, the office park. Oh, oh, then you went and had the interview. You're right. Far out. But it was very quick. She, she, uh, yeah. So you, so you were a student here. You one morning you decided to leave. You went down to Atlanta. You taught school. How did you got a job teaching school? Yeah, I was. Uh, you must have applied for that. No. Mm -mm. I was, what, why was I at this, I was at a reception or a party or something. I can't remember how I got invited or why I was there. And I was talking to this woman who um, got into a conversation about education and I was expounding on my views of education and black uh, children or whatever. And it turned out she was principal of Washington Art School. She said, uh, well, we need somebody to start next week, so as a substitute teacher, so why don't you come Oh, in? my goodness. Yeah, right. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, why did you go onto the truck? The extra money. Oh. I wasn't doing anything else. I tend to want to fold my life up with stuff. Uh-huh. Um, and I was never afraid of work. You know, like some people say, I would never work at McDonald's. I would work at McDonald's. I don't have a problem with that. Um, this guy would haul stuff and um, junk and help people move. And he was an interesting old black guy and I thought it was cool. And so then you got this job for the state of Georgia. Right. What were you doing? 
Developing a mathematical model to estimate the need for general short stay hospital beds in the state of Georgia. Wow. So that formula had, was used for many years to determine whether uh, hospitals should be uh, given a certificate of approval for building or expansion. Your formula that you developed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Did you ever publish it? No. Oh, they haven't published anything. I don't yeah. care. <clears throat> and then I wanted to improve this model using a um, matrix-based approach. Um, sort of the ideas that I had been thinking about when I did the um, relationship between the, the, the uh, using counties as uh, mm -hmm. units of observation. Uh, but that was giving um, an estimate that was, in my mind, more precise but smaller than the original linear model that I gave them. Um, and they didn't want to have a model that produced estimates that restrictive. Um, so they pay, They said, well, we'll just pay you for another year. Thanks a lot. My goodness. Yeah. Even without even staying there? You mean I, I went in from time to time, but I didn't need to stay there. They had already, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. How did, so, okay, so now this is like 79? Yeah, by this time it's like 79, 80. And so, so, yeah, 79, yeah. It's getting on late, so I don't want yeah, to get right, too much right, longer, right. but I do uh, want to find out how you got into the CDC oh. and how you finished your dissertation. Right. <laughs> and then I'll let you go. That's all Gladys Reynolds. Gladys Reynolds um, was my most ardent mentor, I think. So, so when did you meet Gladys? What? How did you meet Gladys? Oh, Gladys used to teach experimental design and the biometry program at Emory in the summer after lunch. Now, do you, you know how Gladys' voice is, right? But how did you get into the summer program at Emory after lunch? I mean, what? I was in the biometry program, remember? Oh, you mean you met Gladys Back. right after Morehouse? There you go. Oh. Yeah. I didn't realize that you went back that far. Right? Yeah. Did you stay in touch with her? Or no. Time? Not at all. And I don't know how she found that I was in Atlanta. I, 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 maybe I went to an ASA meeting or something like that. I don't know how she found that I was in Atlanta. But uh, she called me and said, we need to talk. And I went out and we had this wonderful lunch. And... Um, the M, uh, CDC was in a, um, no, a firing freeze, so no one had been hired in a full-time position at CDC for something like three years. And people were standing in line to, to, who had worked in their temporary position waiting for, for a full-time position. And I don't know how she did it, but I was the first hire after the freeze. That's Gladys Reynolds. Wow. She was relentless. <laughs> and then, so when I came, she said, okay, so, dissertation, right? She said, uh, well, you need to finish this by next year. So I needed to finish it by 1982. So and this was 81 that you got the, the position at CDC? This or? was 81 that I got the position at CDC. Uh, yeah, maybe late 80 and early, early, or early 81, yeah. And, um, so were you working for them?